entering. Ladies and gentlemen, direct from Birmingham, England, the world's loudest talk show host, the snow ghost, Bruce Russell. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you. Snow ghost, snow ghost, snow ghost. How's Thank it? you. How you doing, Bruce? Pretty good. <laughs> How are you? I'm struggling this morning, actually, because today's show. Yeah, it really shows. <laughs> Well, thanks. That's really considerate of you to say that. What a nice guy, you know? First, there was a snow ghost on top of a silver mountain. Night ghost is your community host. A snow ghost wants to get the most out of you. Cause a better world begins with you. So, because today's show is about is about uh, coffee, right? And so, part of the show is that I'm going to try to see how much I can accelerate my resting pulse rate, um, you know, uh, just by drinking coffee. So I haven't had any coffee so far this morning. So at the one minute mark, the pulse rate will be 85. All right. So I'll just kind of keep track of it. I think it'll be in the this corner of the screen during most of the show. It's interesting, actually, during the opening introduction, my pulse rate went from 80 to about 110, like All that. Right. Because I think it was because of the excitement of being on the community show. All right. I think you're pleasure. I think the others you could be excited because I'm here too. So. Well, I well, I think these guys are definitely excited. All right. Before we introduce the guests and talk about coffee, there was a news item. Did you want to talk about this news item here? It's called. It's a story from uh, Sweden, from June 19th, 2007. Man gets sick benefits for heavy metal addiction. A Swedish heavy metal fan has had his musical preferences officially classified as a disability. The results of a psychological analysis enabled the metal lover to supplement his income with state benefits. Roger Tolgren, 42, from Hasselholm in southern Sweden, has just started working part-time as a dishwasher at a local restaurant. Because heavy metal dominates so many aspects of his life, the, empl the employment service has agreed to pay part of Tolgren's salary. His new boss, meanwhile, has given him special dispensation to play loud music at work. What do you think of that? I think that's, that's awesome. It's about time people gave a succession to metal, I mean. Yeah, but these guys aren't necessarily praising metal. They're saying it's like an addiction. Well, it's not a, it's not a, it's They're not saying a, it's a disease. Yeah, there's no disease. I mean, if you want to label a disease, how about drugs and alcohol? That's a disease. Well, they would probably give him, you know... This is just the opposite. This is like the most harmful addiction that you could possibly be addicted to. The most harmful or the least harmful? The most least. The least harmful addiction you can, you can get to. Can I introduce the guest? I never got to introduce... I don't know if I ever introduced the guest yeah, you go on any show. Oh, yeah. This will be my show to introduce the guest. Today's guest, to my right, your left, Claire Schaefer Duffy. And Gray Harrison. Hey, Mike. How's it going, Gray? Great. Hello. <laughs> it was good that you're on the show. And today we're going to talk about coffee. We have a bunch of coffee here. We have a bunch of mugs. Bruce, how many cups of coffee a day do you drink nowadays? Well, it's about average. I mean, it's funny you should ask that because when I, mean, I, like, when I make coffee at home, mm -hmm. I mean, I do like an average six, but it means I might take two sips out of it and it's like, Stick it on the stick it on the floor. Stick, put it down, and you just start jamming, and not even really think about it. The coffee, but when it's like I'm going volunteer at, at night, it's like coffee's always right there. So I think I probably drink more than more than there, and I do at home. My guess from knowing you is that you drink 12 cups a day. Does that seem about right? Probably more on a bad, on a, more on a. More on a bad day or, or a stressful or day where I haven't had much sleep, so. <laughs> I can understand that. So how about you guys, our guests? What, what do you have to say about coffee in the city of Worcester? Well, I drink the way Bruce described. I, I sip through the day. I don't have 12 cups, but I probably have three or four. And then in preparation for the show, I was thinking, like, why 
am I always making a cup of coffee? And it goes back to my grandmother, because she drank the way you're describing. She used to just make cups through the day, not necessarily drink them all, but to kind of have them. And I, I have so many positive memories um, associated with her that I think when I'm making those cups of coffee, it's, it's like, well, I'm bringing a piece of my grandmother into this moment. And also, it, it, if you're a person who works a lot, like I am, it, you don't have to stop to drink your coffee. You can just take it with you. You can do your writing, or you can do, I even walk and drink my coffee which I did going to Mass today. <laughs> I was slugging the coffee before I walked in the church. Well, I mean, when I started drinking coffee, I was like five years old, and I drank regular, regular, regular coffee, the caffeine coffee. Then as time, after a time I gave up, time I was giving up alcohol, and just the time I was coming off the, the addiction of alcohol, mm -hmm. And I was like drinking <coughs> decaffeinated coffee, and for some reason, I just like for the last I don't know since I've been here in, in the U.S., I've been drinking like a, a regular caffeine coffee. Mm -hmm. Well, Greg, what's your relationship to coffee? I really love coffee. Uh, it's probably my favorite drink. Um, in fact, sometimes I think that if I was shipwrecked on an on a island in the South Pacific somewhere and there wasn't any coffee, the first thing I would do when I get back to civilization is have a cup of coffee. That, that you know, I've thought about these things very carefully. What would I do? Would I, you know, go take a swim or would I go have a nice meal? No, I'd have a cup of coffee, definitely. And, um, I try and limit my coffee intake to about three cups a day, usually two in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, but I, if I just let myself go, I would probably drink a lot. That's mm -hmm. what I find. I don't, I'm not able to maintain that responsible level, so I admire that. Three, that sounds like a good idea, three cups a day. I have the same relationship, though. I've thought, you know, in extreme situations, coffee is like the first thing I think of because uh, if I had to, I've been in quite a few conflict zones and I thought, you know, even if there's a battle and there's snipers shooting at the house and I have to cross the street and get out of the house, I would still need to have like half a cup of hot coffee before I could evacuate the house or face <laughs> danger, which is really, yeah, yeah, I think really bad. <laughs> I think there's like five reasons why a cup of coffee is like a very, is a five, five reasons. I can think, think the five reasons why coffee is better than one of the only drinks you could possibly drink. Why coffee is the best drink? Why coffee is a better beverage to drink. What are the five reasons? Because there's number one, you could use any place, any, there's any place you can get a cup of coffee at all hours of the night, okay. all hours of the day. Availability. Availability. Okay. Number two is like, if you're at home and it's like, you don't really want to make the coffee because it's like too much work washing the cup. This way you can carry the coffee with you at all the time. And Portability. No, unfortunately, number f f you can. It helps you think better. Is that number three? Yeah. Okay. And you just need that extra. Once you come to the the end of your rope for that day or during the evening before you go to you go to have to, to get on with your life. And most people have to get up in the morning and stuff. So it helps you get that extra energy that you might need just to get where you're going. If you had to go see a mile or something like that, and it helps you keep you somewhat focused to get you to your to your your destination or your point. Because I mean, when I get to like into New York City to, to, to record, and it's like, uh, that's the first thing I always have to do is get a coffee. So wait, is this the third, this is the third reason? Or yeah. The five reasons? So what's the fourth reason? This is the fourth reason. All right, I got lost on the way from the third to the fourth. Is there, right. What's the fifth reason? No, well, I haven't finished the fourth all reason right. yet. All right. And I always have to get a coffee because it's like from right enough all that time and waiting and sitting on a bus. It's like you said, falling asleep, and I just need to have that boost to get there because I just want to be have a sight when it in me and put that fire out. And that coffee allows me to do that. It kind of kind of finds out who I am and. 
what I'm there for, for there for a reason, you know. It gets you in the mood. Well, it gets me in the mood, and it relaxes me. Because okay. people always talk about, if they drink more than 14 cups, they drink more, a lot of coffee, like eight cups, mm -hmm. and then it's, it's, it's the opposite for me. It relaxes me, so it makes me hyper. Okay. I think without the coffee, I'd be hyper. You know what I think makes you hyper is sugar. What's that? You know what I think makes you hyper is sugar. What's that? I'm just saying, sure. when you drink like a bunch of root beer or something. Yeah, because I start, get, cause I no. start hackling and tackling or whatever, like I don't know her <laughs> anyway, but. <laughs> and so what's the fifth reason? I mean, sometimes it's, a, I think the best is, is for some people, it's like having that 10 o'clock mid-morning coffee is a great thing, but I think waiting until like 8, 9 o'clock at night to have a coffee, because I heard that uh, the coffee, if you have a cup of coffee before you go to bed, it's supposed to relax you. <laughs> I never heard that, but it may be true. Yeah, it's interesting the different reactions people have. Because sometimes coffee in the afternoon will put my wife to sleep, but it wakes me up and gets me going. Yeah, especially if you're just coming out from the cold or something like that. That coffee is like the last cup of coffee at night before you hit the sack. Mm -hmm. you, before you go into your, get to your house, it kind of helps you warm you up. You know, when you were describing the situations in which you drink coffee and I was thinking of my own circumstances. In Europe, people actually sit outside in street side cafes and linger over coffee and I've always envied that. I think when I get my cup, I'm associating with that activity even though I'm not doing it. And in America, we're, we tend to be coffee on the go people, but I do, think something is lost. I know in Eastern Europe, I, there, there would be so many cities that I, that I was in where you'd see men, often, often men, sitting at tables, talking in the evening over small cups of thick, dark coffee, and it just seemed so peaceful and um, authentic. I used to wish for more moments like that, so I think I associate that with coffee whenever I have a cup, that that's what I'm doing, even though I'm not really doing it. I'm I mean, we used to do that when, like, in London, we'd be sitting there. Yeah, it's like we do it, like we did in a pub, and sit there, have a pint of beer, and just sit there relaxing. And it's like, mm -hmm. everybody in America is like, boom. <laughs> and it's like, I, I, I did the same thing. I felt the same way when I did it. The, that when you do the, I do the same thing with, uh, with tea. I just sit there and relax it because it's like. You just enjoy that. Enjoying cup of tea. coffee. Coffee. Enjoy that because cup of coffee. Because I mean, coffee. the point, the thing about it, the thing is this it's like when you have that cup of tea or having that coffee, and you. That may be your last cup of coffee or tea that you're going to have for maybe for the next two hours, and you really want to enjoy that coffee. It's like watching your favorite program, your favorite program or listening to your favorite song. Whatever, whatever that is, you want to enjoy that. That's that's your quiet time, and you really want to focus on that quiet time. And having that, and then have, able to do that is either having your your coffee or your tea. The same thing when you go to a show, you're watching your favorite programs. The same thing. There you go. Well, I wanted to ask you guys about sources. Your sources of coffee. <laughs> Where do you get your coffee? Let's we'll start with Greg, because you haven't talked for a while. Sure. Um, well. I'll, I'll get my coffee wherever I can get it, but um, okay. generally speaking, I buy it at, is it okay to mention Living Earth? I think yeah. you can, yeah, we can talk All about right. places we like. So I, I generally buy it at Living Earth. Um, there's a local coffee roaster called Global to Local Coffee, and he gets organic, fair trade, and other types of coffee that um, I'd like to support a local business. So mm -hmm. I get that, they sell the whole beans, take it home, grind it up, and make it. Do you buy? Do you ever buy coffee like from restaurants or like from restaurants or cafes or shops? Uh, or well, around? you know, like Bruce was talking about, uh, and Claire, the one of the great things about coffee is going to a coffee shop, and mm -hmm. uh, so coffee shops are awesome to sit and relax and have a nice cup of coffee. Unfortunately, in Worcester, the uh, there's not a lot of organic fair trade at the coffee shops, and I'd like to see that change. Oh, yeah. it's, it's surprising too because there are a couple of, there are several really nice places. There's like the Bean Counter, Java Hut. I know Bruce is a big fan of the, hanging out the White Hen and having a coffee down there. But I like the Java Hut and the, the, 
Well, I'm just <laughs> thinking like the fact that you can buy or you can buy an organic. Is the new is the McDonald's stuff also fair trade? Yes, it is. So you can buy an organic fair trade cup of coffee at McDonald's. Up in Maine South. In Maine South or wherever, right. but you can't buy a cup of organic fair trade. At least they don't advertise it at like. Nice, Joe's or something at like the that. nice coffee places in right. the city. Jabber Joe's doesn't offer offer organic coffee. He's just like regular coffee. Well, that's a shame. I don't you know, know, I think I think that uh, that I mean I think the organic coffee. I think that Worcester should do, 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 really should market the uh, fair trade coffee more than it is because maybe the reason why there isn't a lot of it because they don't have really no market to it. So maybe that's why it's scarce to get and why it's so expensive and so hard to find it and get it at selected, selected stores. Well, you know what, though? I think, I think for some people it's also a question of making, I don't know if making a lifestyle change is an exaggeration, but of just becoming more thoughtful about it. Right. Because like the other day we were watching this movie with Gray about um, shade-grown coffee, like coffee, bird-friendly coffee, mm -hmm. one thing that they would call it. You know, coffee that's grown in such a way that you're not destroying the forest completely so that you're preserving species of birds, especially migratory songbirds that right. spend part of their time in North America and part of their time down in the rainforest area right. where the coffee is grown. Right. And watching this, I just think, well, of course I want to buy bird-friendly coffee. Of course I want to buy shade-grown coffee. Of course I want to buy organic and buy fair trade coffee. Like, for the amount of money that it would cost me extra, for this amount of coffee that I drink, is not very much. Like I don't have a lot of money, but that seems like a reasonable place to put my money, you know. Um, but do I actually do this? No, I don't have the ha I don't have the habit of it. I just have not developed the habit of of buying that. I think for a lot of people, maybe that's that's where they are. Yeah, I think the matter of buying coffee justly is first. It's consciousness. You have to be aware that mm -hmm. the coffee that you're buying is not produced justly. And I, I think that takes a little bit, you know, the movies that, that Gray was showing at Stone Soup, and we had a friend talk about fair trade at the Catholic Worker, and he showed a movie. And after you see the movie and you see how the workers are treated, you do, you have the same reaction, like, mm -hmm. well, good grief, I don't want to buy coffee that is causing harm to somebody else, or I want to buy coffee that's fairly produced. But the next step is availability, because you think people, when they leave for work, a lot of people work seven to three, so they're getting coffee at six in the morning, and that one place like Living Earth that sells a fair trade is not open, so you go to the Dunkin' Donuts, right. or you go, you know, and I, I have a public confession to make. I'm a Dunkin' Donut addict. I go down the street constantly. I did try to give it up for Lent. But now I've just learned. I've Wait, just learned. Wait, you try to give up drinking coffee? Or no, good done. Lord. <laughs> nobody could live with me if I gave up coffee for Lent. But I tried, you know, to abstain, not for Lent, but, but sort of as a practice in very, very modest asceticism, giving up the Dunkin' Donuts cup. But I just learned, and I, it's worth investigating if you want to check this out for your show, that Dunkin' Donuts is owned by Carlisle, uh, the Carlisle Group. I don't know if that's correct, but now that's put me in a quandary because I'm thinking, I don't, it, it's not only that it's coffee that isn't fairly produced, it's coffee that is owned by a company who's engaged in all kinds of works that are uh, contrary to you know the benefit of the human community. So. Now I have to reevaluate my I whole Dunkin' Donuts I habit. I also heard that Dunkin' Donuts used to put some kind of like, used to put the, some kind of that chemical that they use, I think to wash your pots out, they used to put that in your bean at one time. So they went off and use a weaker bean. Mm. So I think that you either gonna get the chemical in the bean that they use when they wash your pots out, or you're gonna get a weaker coffee. But you know, Bruce, I did hear last summer and, and actually saw this, Dunkin' Donuts was selling uh, fair trade for their espresso coffee. And if you, uh, you would see on some of the, the Dunkin' Donuts shops, we sell fair trade on the door. So I think that's a small sign of hope that we have to ask as consumers for that kind of coffee. And mm -hmm. every time you go to the counter and say, do you have fair trade, it's a step towards making uh, the market more conscious that that's what people want. Let me, I wanted to say, since we've been talking about um, fair trade and organic without really defining what we're talking about, 
I wanted to read a passage from Marion Nestle's book, What to Eat, where she talks about this a little bit. Uh, certified Organic tells you that the farmer's growing practices follow standards for use of fertilizers, pesticides, and land, and that the farm has been inspected to make sure the rules are followed. And those standards would involve, I guess, not using um, undesirable chemicals, chemical fertilizers, things like that. Fair trade certification is about making a decent living. The coffee growers must be paid above market prices for their crops. Most but not all fair trade coffees and teas are also certified organic and shade grown, but they do not have to be. And that uh, shade grown meaning that um, I guess there's a certain amount of trees that are left on the land when they're done. This brings us to Rainforest Alliance certification, which deals with labor as well as environmental concerns. Growers must pay workers above market rates, pay men and women equally, allow workers to organize, and must adhere to the country's child labor laws. Not necessarily organic, though. All these labels are backed up by inspection systems, and all are highly recommended by Consumers Union, the publisher of Consumers Reports. But none of them covers everything, so you have to pick your issue. This is, this is actually something I was talking to um, a guy yesterday um, who was very interested in coffee. And he was saying, well, are some of these certification labels sort of sketchy? And I said, well, you know, Marion Nestle is, I think, a very skeptical writer about these, these issues. And I think, you know, I was telling him, like, she basically looked into it and found that, in fact, they were not sketchy, that a lot of this was just sort of propaganda by, you know, conventional farmers groups who are interested in undermining the idea of fair trade or interested in undermining the idea of organic, that by and large these are pretty reliable mm -hmm. measures. There's a, there's a couple of other really good coffee roasters in New England who are very concerned about uh, doing the right thing by the people growing coffee, such as Dean's Beans and the Equal Exchange uh, Coffee people. And I know that they travel around the world. They travel to the coffee farms. They meet the people. They work with the people. Uh, Equal Exchange is a cooperatively, a worker cooperative type business. And they are uh, not just working to make sure that people get a fair price for their coffee, but they're, they're working with groups of people to set up co-ops and get people working together. and. Um, in a more democratic way for all sorts of things, uh, not only social justice in their, in their countries, but um, to better take care of the land and better take care of their communities and education and the whole, it's a very holistic uh, way of looking at the coffee production, which is uh, one of the biggest industries in the world. It's true. Yes, they, one member of Equal Exchange came to our house and showed a movie about how they are trying to support cooperatives, particularly in Central America. And it was an extraordinary experience because one of our guests is from El Salvador and her children pick coffee. And so she was very familiar with the scenes from the movie mm -hmm. and she described how as she picked coffee when she was there. She was trying to make a living out of like three different um, jobs and no, Victoria? yeah yeah and her children oh, during that. the um, November December break the even the the 11 year old would go out and she could tell you how much they made you know who who would get what for the 25 pound bag who would get what for 50 she was I think up to a hundred pounds of beans that I, I I can't remember the specifics but it was a small amount of money and not enough for the family you know, to make it, it this was just, uh, so these cooperatives are really important. Equal Exchange will do presentations at churches, and I thought that was a beginning, that they'll come to your mm -hmm. parish and sort of try to get you to switch your coffee hour to coffee that's produced justly, <laughs> so I you're think, serving. I think it's interesting that there's actually a, a number of, um, sort of Christian groups that are yeah, connected yeah, yeah. into this fair mm -hmm. trade issue, which is a good... I think, I think UU project. does it in Worcester, the Unitarian Universalists. Mm -hmm. they, they serve equal exchange, I think, at their coffee hour, which is a beginning. You know, it's just once a week coffee, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a start. I think, yeah, it's, a, it's an issue that I think most consumers uh, should be very aware of, you know, where we spend our money. And when I go to the bean counter or something like that, um, I'm, I'm concerned that they don't sell organic fair trade coffee. They do sell organic coffee sometimes, but I want to 
work with them and work with the other coffee shops and maybe even work with the city of Worcester. Uh, I think in an ideal world, Worcester could become a center where only organic fair trade coffee is, is sold in the coffee shops and it could be something that makes us special in a way that um, the whole community of Worcester gets around this issue and uh, supports the changeover to organic fair trade. Yeah, I should, I should point out that um, we had a few people who were sort of connected to the business of coffee who were interested to come on today, but we sort of intentionally decided that this show would be the judgmental show. <laughs> so we have like a bunch of <laughs> civilians here, and I hope that on a future episode of, this will be probably the first show, last show we'll tape for a while, but I hope on a future episode of the Snow Ghost Show, we can have some people who are connected to uh, the business of coffee. You were telling me a story the other day, Gray, about um, your local coffee shop that you had talked to them about trying to switch over to a different, uh, Right. what was it? Just so there's a new coffee shop in Holden, and I live in Jefferson, so I go through Holden every day, practically on my way to Worcester. And um, when they opened up, I said, geez, it would be great if you had some organic fair trade in here. And uh, the response was, yes, it would be great. However, the roaster does not make it available. And since the coffee shop depends on the roaster for a consistent supply of coffee and also depends on the roaster for the machines, like the espresso machines and stuff like that, uh, the coffee shop just can't go down to some place and buy organic fair trade and start selling it in their shop. They have to sell the coffee that the roaster supplies. And the mm -hmm. roaster does not want to supply fair trade right. organic. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Remember the day we went to that uh, Bullies? The coffee place? Where, is, where was this? In Worcester? Kind of like Millbury Street. Oh, the the uh, the Belfry. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that? Didn't they sell the organic coffee there? They did trade? have organic there. I don't know if they had fair trade. I remember they had organic because you said, "Do you have organic coffee?" And they said, "Yes, we do." And you said, "How quaint." All right. <laughs> and I remember we went in the other. We went to this like bread and bagel place in, in Brainerd, and they had like a different flavors of like organic coffee you know, that was already there. So that was good. Well, I mean. Let me, let me interrupt you because I think we, it's time to, to the gift. All right. Well, I think we come to the time to uh, give our guests their gifts. Provided by our sponsor. By a, provided by our sponsor, Happy Birthday, Michael Lee. And we thank him, Jacob. Would you wish you could be here? Here's one gift. Great. Maybe Greg could have this. I don't know. Oh, yeah. And here's one for Claire. Oh, wow. The Dream of the Wabbit Fiend <laughs> by Devlin Thompson. It's really easy to a little thing in there. Anyway, thank you so much, Bruce. Thanks for very you. thoughtful no of you. Thanks, Bruce, and thanks to um, no Happy Birthday, Mike Yes, Mike thank for you. This thank awesome you to Happy Birthday, Mike Lesley. Character. Bruce, did you have a final message that you wanted to say to the people of Worcester? Yes, on I this mean, show? And there's actually two things I like to address. I mean, this is some people. I have a tendency to think that some people in Worcester think the show is about only a. A satanic ritual holocaust and a lip for the undead. It is not. That's just the opposite. It's a show about the community. It's a show about the community. We're talking about community c community things. And I get. I know I'm going to get a lot of reaction for being myself, being myself, because I am the master. First, there was a snow ghost on top of a silver mountain. wants to get the most out of you Cause a battle world begins with